The Federal Reserve System is fraudulent. Whatever its stated purpose, its effective purpose is to create a mechanism of deficit spending by politicians through the most insidious, invisible taxation of monetary debasement, a.k.a. inflation. Those are the words of Eric Voorhees, the CEO of crypto financial exchange Shapeshift. Long before he started Shapeshift, Eric was opposed to some of the core principles of the global financial system, in which he sees the U.S. dollar as a means of control. As an early adopter of Bitcoin, Eric saw a way to make financial transactions without using fiat currency. Eric's company Shapeshift allows users to convert digital currencies between each other. Because Shapeshift only makes exchanges of currencies and does not hold much currency at any time, Shapeshift is resilient to hacking. In this episode, Eric and I discussed his economic philosophy and how that informs his affinity for cryptocurrencies. Eric also describes the architecture of Shapeshift and gives some advice for how to think about building businesses around cryptocurrencies. Shapeshift has had a few near-death experiences, like any startup, and there's a useful story in this episode about how to survive and recover from a serious business setback. Software Engineering Daily is brought to you by Consensus. Do you think blockchain technology is only used for cryptocurrency? Think again. Consensus develops tools and infrastructure to enable a decentralized future built on Ethereum, the most advanced blockchain development platform. Consensus has hundreds of Web3 developers that are building decentralized applications, focusing on world-changing ideas like creating a system for self-sovereign identity, managing supply chains, developing a more efficient electricity provider, and much more. So, listeners, why continue to build the Internet of today when you can build the Internet of the future on the blockchain? Consensus is actively hiring talented software developers to help build the decentralized web. Learn more about Consensus projects and open source jobs at consensus.net slash sedaily. That's C-O-N-S-E-N-S-Y-S dot net slash S-E daily. Consensus dot net slash S-E daily. Thanks again, Consensus. Eric Voorhees is the CEO of Shapeshift. Eric, welcome to Software Engineering Daily. Thanks for having me on the show. Shapeshift is a technology company and a financial institution, and I want to discuss Shapeshift itself, but beforehand, I'd like to explore your personal views on economics, some of the things that led you to starting Shapeshift. The first question is, what are the biggest systemic problems with the modern financial system? Wow, we're, we're just diving right in deep to that question, aren't we? <laughs> yes. <laughs> okay, well, I think the biggest systemic issue is, is that money itself namely the dollar or any other fiat currency, which is sort of the, you can think of it as like the base protocol of the economy. Money is is currently centrally planned and controlled. And we live in a allegedly market-based or or capitalistic economy. And yet the, the most important good, which is money itself, is centrally planned and controlled. I think that is uh, hugely problematic. I don't think any person or group of people in the world is smart enough, wise enough, or ethical enough to be in charge of something so fundamental to everyone's life. So that that's really what got me interested in, in crypto and in cryptocurrency, was it to have a market-based money as an alternative to a centrally planned uh, coercion-based money. Describe the most ideal world economic system that you think we could someday get to, perhaps by way of these technologies that we're going to be discussing. Well, probably the right answer to that is to take the humble path of not knowing what the right solution for everyone is. And this is why I'm generally a free market person. Is It's not because I purport to know how the world should work. It's because I don't know how the world should work. And I think people should generally be left alone to figure that out for themselves. So I think you know that was impossible when money itself was controlled. Now that there is a way for people to have a free market form of money, I think they can actually become more free in their own lives. And we can actually see much more experimentation and allow people to live, you know, a more sovereign lifestyle. 
Do you think it's an inevitability that we're going to get there, or do you think there's some probability still that all of this technology could get stamped out? I think it's inevitable. So what's not inevitable is which of these different cryptocurrencies will be successful, right? So Bitcoin could fail, Litecoin could fail, and any of these others could fail. But the ability to move value instantly anywhere in the world for essentially zero cost without anyone being able to stop it, I think that is a power that is inevitable. In other words, as the world, as people discover it, they will demand it and they won't settle for for less than that. So in the same way that, you know, once email happened or VoIP or the web itself, it's just too powerful for people that it could have been stopped. There's no way to stop the web after the genie's out of the bottle. There's no way to stop email after the genie's out of the bottle. It delivers too much value to too many people around the world for it to be prevented forever. Now, that doesn't mean that various governments won't interfere with its adoption or harm it in certain ways, but I think over time it becomes universal. Let's say that a new U.S. president has just been elected, and they name you, Eric Voorhees, the chief of crypto economic policy. What would you do? (laughs) Maybe first change my title away from uh, chief of policy to to be more like (laughs) perhaps just a... humble representative with some thoughts. And (laughs) those thoughts would generally be laissez-faire thoughts, meaning don't set policy for something as complicated as a marketplace. Allow the marketplace to find its own policies through emergent order. And that's a very scary thought, I think, to people who assume that systems must be controlled from the center. But as I've grown older, I've come to see how much order there is in emergent systems, both in in the natural world and in human interactions as well. Language being a really great example, right? So no one's in charge of language, but it has structure, it has meaning, it has rules, and people follow them, even though no one is forced at gunpoint to do so. So I think the concept of emergent order is very important. And if if I had a position of power like that, that would be my my primary platform. Now, I'm... I'm basically in agreement with you, but you must admit that there is some consequence of that emergent order, such as perhaps people who have no idea what different tokens do, buying these tokens that may have no value. People get wrapped up into Ponzi schemes that are clearly Ponzi schemes, and so there does probably need to be some kind of policing of that behavior, right? Or do you just consider the financial pain that these kinds of people who who get wrapped up into these Ponzi schemes suffer? Do you just consider that an inevitable consequence and perhaps we shouldn't be policing against that? No. So fraud is illegal, period. Theft is illegal, period. These things are not suddenly okay just because they're done with a different tool. And they don't require some vast regulatory apparatus. If you are lying to people, misrepresenting uh, something that's fraud. So that's that's the kind of thing that should be policed. I wish that's what the government would do. I wish they would go around policing fraud instead of making up thousands of pages of obnoxious regulation that punish the people who aren't out there frauding people. So you have an interesting line on your profile from the Bitcoin talk forums. I don't know how outdated this is, or maybe it's maybe it's totally up to date. But it says, democracy is the original 51% attack. What do you mean by that? <laughs> yeah, so I wish I could take credit for that statement. Um, that's something that I saw, I think, back when I used to be on the Bitcoin talk forums a lot. Someone said that, and I, I picked it up and ran with it because it was such a great saying. I'm not really a fan of of democracy, and largely it's because the more power that that a group of people have over an individual, the more dangerous that is. So if you think of a world in which you have an ultimate democracy, meaning you you vote on, on everything and nothing is protected, in other words, anything that the majority says goes, I think that's a really horrifying and dangerous world. And I think it was just a really nice representation of the concept of a 51% attack in Bitcoin. I think the rights of minorities have to be protected. And the ultimate minority is the individual who is just one person. And against an individual, a mob mentality of democracy is a really dangerous thing. Do you have an alternative model for government in mind? Or is there you know, books that people can refer to, to to study this concept in more detail? I don't know that there is a better model for governance. Maybe there is, maybe not. The, the question is one of scope. 
So when I say I dislike democracy, it doesn't mean I would replace it with a king who is in charge of everyone's lives. What it does mean, however, is that the scope of what a democracy can act on, I think, should be minimized to the greatest degree possible. So a local democracy in your town that has authority over you know, the trash pickup schedule, the danger of that is highly limited. And in small groups, democracy can actually work pretty well. You know, like The smaller the group, the more effective and reasonable a democracy generally is. So reducing the scope that democracies can, can vote and affect, I think, is the key, not not necessarily that democracies themselves should be replaced with anything else. The U.S. dollar is an inflationary currency. Inflation means that your dollars lose value over time. What are the pros and cons of inflation as a feature of currency? <laughs> yeah, so inflation has become this thing that most people simply attribute as a like effect of nature or a force of nature, like like the winds and the rain. People are used to going to the grocery store and, you know, each year the, f the price of the food that they're getting inches higher and higher. And we just kind of learn that when we're little and we accept it and we, you know, we expect that 10 years from now bread will cost more than it does today. None of that is a natural consequence of markets. What it is is a natural consequence of printing money. So the reason prices rise is because Governments print their money consistently and continuously, which debases the value of it. And thus, it's not really that the things are getting more expensive. It's that the money you're using to buy them is becoming worth less. Now, you can find all sorts of economists that will give you every justification they need to tell you why that's important, why governments need to inflate the currency. And most of it is just economic sophistry. It's ridiculous. The U.S., for example, you know, when it was founded up until about 1912, when the Federal Reserve was created, did not have general price inflation. So a loaf of bread cost roughly the same at the birth of the country as it did in, uh, in 1900. And most people would be quite shocked probably to hear that, but it's true. And meanwhile, even without inflation, and this was, of course, it, it wasn't inflated back then because uh, dollars were backed by gold, which you can't inflate. Even though there was no inflation in the general money supply, you had the largest and strongest period of economic growth that any nation in the world had ever seen. You had a country rise from essentially a small agrarian economy to one of the industrial superpowers of the world in 150 years, all without an inflationary currency. I think that is a really good example of the at minimum, how unnecessary inflationary currency is. And I would make the argument that it's worse than unnecessary. It is actually very harmful and damaging. There is the argument that deflationary currencies result in people holding their currency because if your currency is just going to go up in value, which is a characteristic of deflationary currency, then why would you spend it today? Why are some economists critical of deflationary currencies? And what are, what's your position on deflationary currencies? Great question. So I would say more, it's not just some economists are critical of it. The establishment economist is highly critical of it. So it, it is the norm and it is the accepted truth that deflationary currencies are bad. I disagree with it. And one thing I've seen that has been really interesting in the crypto world is this example of a currency you know, Bitcoin or some of these others that not only gain in value a little bit over the years, but gain in value massively. So it's not like they're, it's not like next year, Bitcoin will buy you 5% more than it does today. On average, it'll, it'll might buy you 10 X what it does today. So it's like a, a, a very severe example of this effect. And what you would expect is that no one would ever spend their Bitcoin on any, anything because of that. If that theory of this deflationary spiral was true and because Bitcoin rises so dramatically no one should ever spend it on anything. And what we see is that that's not at all the case. The people spend it often and actually tend to spend it the most during the periods when it is rallying the most. I think people in some graduate studies classes need to do some analysis on this because I think in Bitcoin, you will actually find the disapproval of the deflationary spiral thesis. And uh, it's been really remarkable to watch. And, and you can get data on this stuff. You can talk to the merchant processing companies like BitPay. And <laughs> unequivocally, they have the highest sales and the strongest growth when Bitcoin is surging, even though people know that Bitcoin will likely be worth more 
you know, days or weeks later. And the fundamental reason is that money is, is not worth anything on its own. It's only worth what it can buy. And, and at some point, you need to eat. At some point, you need a car. At some point, you need a home. So even though your money might appreciate over the next year, you don't just hold on to money forever without buying anything or, or you'll starve to death in a, in a gutter. And that's, I think, really the, the critical weakness that the deflationary spiral misses. And the data points that I hear people refer to when they talk about the problems of deflationary currency, the most common one I hear is some, something that happened to Japan at some point where when they had a deflationary currency. And you compare that, whatever, I don't know what, what event that was or when that happened, but that's such a different set of circumstances than we have today. Like today we have e-commerce. And if we're talking about Bitcoin, we have a currency that is very much more divisible than whatever the currency was in Japan at that time. And there's just all these other variables. I mean, the internet, like there's so many other other things that have changed. And when you take the circumstances of an economy together with the characteristics of the currency, then you're running a completely different experiment than whatever was run 20 or 30 years ago. Well, yeah, that's that's fair. And also, I think people need to understand the difference between monetary inflation, which means the printing of money, you know, inflating the money supply. That's the original definition of what inflation meant. And the more popular usage of it, which means price inflation, which, which is the increase in prices in an economy. Now, obviously, these things are related, but they're not the same. If you print a bunch of money, that's monetary inflation, and it's likely to cause price inflation, but it might not. There might be other countervailing forces that reduce prices, even though the money supply is increasing. So when people say Japan had a deflationary currency, I don't think that's correct. I think they've had general price deflation among many assets, but the the yen, the fiat yen, is very much an inflationary currency, and more of it is created every year than the one prior. So the terminology is really important. I love podcasts, but even with podcasts, I can't get enough audio delivered into my ears. And that's why I use Audible. Audible is a leading provider of premium digital spoken audio information and entertainment on the internet. Audible content includes lots of audiobooks and other audio products. I mostly use it for audiobooks. You can go to audible.com slash se daily and start a free 30 day trial. Your, your first audiobook is free, and that's the trial plan that I started on four years ago. Since then, I have read a ton of books. I read a lot of business books like The Hard Thing About Hard Things and The Everything Store. Right now, I'm reading a book by Ryan Holiday called Conspiracy, which is about the court case between Gawker and Hulk Hogan. Sometimes I read self-help books. You've got your classics like Seven Habits of Highly Effective People read that a few times, and I, I read some history. I read about uh, President Eisenhower in Ike's Bluff, which is was an interesting story about how to avoid nuclear catastrophe. So I really recommend checking out Audible. Audible.com slash SE Daily would contribute to Software Engineering Daily's uh, sponsorship health with Audible. I'm really glad to have Audible as a sponsor because I use it so regularly, and I hope that you do too. So go to audible.com slash daily and check it out. You can also text daily to the SMS number 500500, and that will give you the same Audible 30-day free trial. You've been harshly critical of the U.S. Federal Reserve. To quote you, (laughs) this is from 2009, so you can let me know if this view is outdated or if you've become less extreme, but you said the Federal Reserve System is fraudulent. Whatever its stated purpose, its effective purpose is to create a mechanism of deficit spending by politicians through the insidious, invisible taxation of a monetary debasement, a.k.a. inflation. And by the way... We will get to shape shift eventually. I just really want I find your views pretty pretty interesting. So I want to go a little bit deeper. Describe your views of the Fed. Yeah, I have to say that 2009 Eric Voorhees sounds pretty smart cuz I I would say that exact <laughs> okay. thing today. Yeah, so 
the Federal Reserve exists to create money out of thin air. And I don't know to what extent the people that work there believe that or if they believe that what they're doing is important. I don't consider them a bunch of like sinister bankers who are trying to screw people. They may all be great people that really believe in what they're doing. But the effect of that institution is that they create money out of thin air. And this is economically destructive and harmful. And the reason it exists or why the governments allow such a a group to create money out of thin air is because it helps the government. So governments generally spend vastly more than they have. And they have three ways of covering that deficit. They, They can tax, they can borrow, which essentially just means tax in the future, and they can print money. And so they're unable, for whatever reason, to ever live within their means. They spend more than they take in in taxes, and they continually borrow more and more. The third way of funding that deficit is is simply by printing the money. And this is why essentially all large governments in the world have central banks and, and why they all do the same activity of printing money. It allows politicians to spend more than they take in in taxes. And I think that's it's a horrible fraud, it's a scam, and it destroys the value of capital, it destroys the value of people's savings over their lifetime for the benefit of the, the then current government and the contractors and institutions that, are, that build up around it. Okay, shifting the conversation to cryptocurrencies, when people try to pinpoint where we are in the evolution of this technology, they often try to compare it to the evolution of the internet. So, you know, they try to draw these timeline analogies between cryptocurrency and the internet. Do you think this is a good analogy or do you think it's misleading? I think it's a good one, but it's not perfect. So it's good in the sense that the internet had a long history of development before it became widely known or used. So sort of in the mid to late 90s, it started getting popular and And by the mid 2000s, it was pretty ubiquitous, but it had 10 or 20 year history before that. And back then, one of the reasons it wasn't used widely was because the infrastructure wasn't there, namely like, you know, high bandwidth connectivity. And the systems were just difficult to use unless you were highly technically proficient. And in that way, Bitcoin has looked very similar. It's getting better each year, but it has been difficult for normal people to use. And it hasn't had a lot of the infrastructure that has been needed to allow it to be used widely. Also, like the internet, I think at some point it will become ubiquitous and it will seem obvious uh, in hindsight. But until that happens, it has a lot of obstacles before mass adoption. One thing that seems to make it a, a, a subpar analogy from my point of view, and you can tell me if I'm wrong... But it seems like back in the evolution of the internet, we had deficiencies in the hardware. We had deficiencies in the physical infrastructure of what we were interacting with our information systems on. But today, we've got that infrastructure, that the physical infrastructure is really well built. The problem with cryptocurrencies is one of software. It's it's one of protocols and you know, is it proof of work? Is it proof of stake? It's it's politics. It's things that are arguably easier to figure out because they're not bound by physical limitations. Or maybe you would say they're harder to figure out because they're not the because there are issues of people than they're issues of ideas. But in any case, it seems like if somebody came out with a software invention tomorrow that fixed scalability, for example it would be like a step change in the usage because that's really the limitation. Or do you disagree with that? You're correct that it's not a hardware level limitation at all. So in that way, it's not similar to the internet. But I think the major obstacles to Bitcoin adoption are not scaling challenges yet. Those are more hypothetical and people that are already into crypto debate those heavily. But the average person is not using Bitcoin, not because of scaling issues. They're not using Bitcoin primarily because they are already used to and comfortable with dollars and credit cards. And they are at the same time scared and nervous about the volatility of Bitcoin. So those two things combined, I think, create a lot of pressure preventing people from trying this stuff out more thoroughly. The volatility gets solved simply with with time and as the market grows. So Bitcoin today is already much more stable than it was when I got involved you know, the last few months have been a, an exception, but it's generally getting much more stable because it's a larger asset class and that will continue. And then it just takes time for people to change their behaviors. You know, when people buy things online with a credit card, it works reasonably well. 
So there's not a huge impetus to to switch, at least if you're an American. But in other countries, you're going to see faster adoption rates because they don't they don't have a a credit card alternative that works well. So they're going to be more willing to try out this weird new thing called Bitcoin than someone who's comfortable buying on Amazon using their their credit card. Okay, makes sense. You run Shapeshift, which is a cryptocurrency exchange and also a set of tools for people who are transacting with the cryptocurrency ecosystem. We've talked about your economic views. How do your economic views inform the direction that you set for Shapeshift? Yeah, good question. So yeah, basically Shapeshift is an easy way for anyone to convert one type of digital asset into another. So if you have Bitcoin and you want Litecoin or you have Ethereum and you want Dash, Shapeshift is probably the easiest way for you to make that trade. I would say the the way that it aligns with my economic views is that it, it doesn't try to dictate or determine which of these technologies is going to be the winner. Um, in other words, it takes in other words, I, I created it because I saw a new asset class forming. I didn't know which of these would be super popular or successful, but I figured the market would determine that over time. And so building a tool that the market could use to express those preferences became an important thing. So Shapeshift sort of, you know, is asset agnostic. You know, it doesn't promote any asset over another. It just adds those which the market is finding useful and, and are seeing high trade volumes. And then over time, you know, hopefully Shapeshift is helping the market figure out which assets are useful. How do cryptocurrency exchanges like Shapeshift, how do they compare to traditional currency exchanges? Yeah, well, ours is pretty unique. So that question would be answered differently if I was talking about a traditional order book exchange like Bitfinex or Coinbase or Kraken or any of those. Shapeshift's different in a in a few ways. One, we don't handle any any currency at all. We don't handle dollars or or euros or yen. We're only digital assets. Two, we don't hold any user funds. So every exchange in the world, pretty much except for Shapeshift, uh, has accounts where people sign up and then they deposit their funds into that exchange. And the exchange is holding it all centrally. And then by so doing, the exchange allows people to trade back and forth. Shapeshift does not hold customer funds, which is much, in my opinion, much better from a security perspective. Because even if we get hacked, we can't lose customer money. And because we don't have that customer money, it makes us less of a target to get hacked in the first place. But also, I, I think it's just it's important from the perspective of what crypto is trying to do, which is to decentralize trust. It has been a great irony of the crypto industry that this amazing technology that decentralizes that decentralizes trust has had these huge centralized exchanges emerge that are holding billions of dollars in customer funds, and we've seen many cases where hacks or, or technical glitches have lost hundreds of millions of dollars. So from that perspective, you know, both so I can sleep at night, not having to hold all that money. And also from a, a more principled perspective, Shapeshift was built to, to be a fairly different model. And Shapeshift, its model would not work with normal fiat currencies. It, it can only work using, using blockchains. Hmm. Why is that? Because fiat currencies always have to be centralized. If you have dollars, they're in a bank account, which immediately means that they're held by some other party. With crypto, you can hold it yourself. And that fundamental difference allows different kinds of models to be built. But for example, we could not use this current model if we wanted to add dollars to Shapeshift, if we wanted to let people buy Bitcoin with dollars or, or any of that. So we are simply natively digital. We stick with only digital assets and we don't touch fiat currencies or any of that stuff whatsoever. Mm, right. And th this is basically because... When you think of holding funds, and this is for, for, for people who are less familiar with how cryptocurrencies work, when you think of yourself as holding funds, you're actually just holding the keys to those funds, and all of those funds are actually, the state of those funds are maintained on the blockchain. And, and basically, when you say you have a wallet, wallet is actually not a good term for what a wallet is. A wallet is just a way to hold the keys, which are your permissions to access the funds that are expressed on that decentralized blockchain. So if I'm swapping Bitcoin for Ether, for example, on Shapeshift, which is one of the things you can do, you can swap different cryptocurrencies for each other. If I want to take out some Bitcoin from my ownership stake in Bitcoin, I put in my Bitcoin address, I put in my Ethereum address, and I input the amount of Bitcoin that I want to swap for Ethereum, because that's what Shapeshift is. It's an exchange. 
when that transaction gets initiated, what is happening on the back end? Can you take me through some of the steps? Yeah. So the other the other piece of this that makes us different from a normal exchange is that we're not matching a buyer and a seller. We are always the seller. So when you come to Shapeshift and you have your Bitcoin and you want your Ether, you come to us, you tell us how much you want, and then we show you an exchange rate. And if that sounds good to you, you send us your Bitcoin. So that's sort of step one is you send your Bitcoin to one of our Bitcoin addresses. As soon as we've confirmed that that Bitcoin has arrived, we send your Ether to you from our wallets. So we're sending you our own property because you sent us yours. That's sort of step one. And that's all that matters really to the user. From a business perspective, what we're doing after that is that now we have too much Bitcoin and too little Ether because we just did a trade with you. So we then are going out into the markets and trading uh, to get our inventories back to where where we want. And you can think of this very similar to like any retail store you know, that has an inventory of assets and they sell them to their customers. And then sometimes they go repurchase that inventory, resupply. And as long as they can buy that inventory for less than they sell, that's their their revenue. Right. So what were some of the challenges to getting that initial currency swapping system developed and deployed? The biggest sort of thematic challenge is that because we're natively on the blockchains and every trade happens on two blockchains, the the one coming into us, the, the asset being sent to us, and then the asset we're sending out, we have adopted all of the scaling and technical challenges of these blockchains themselves. And many of these are in various stages of, you know, alpha or beta level software. So we are running this software at a scale that m- the developers of these systems often have never been able to test themselves. For example, Shapeshift is about 2 or 3% of all Bitcoin transactions in the world, thousands of them every day. So we just run into problems that just hadn't, haven't been seen before. And Bitcoin is one of the most tested and, and bug-free blockchains, but it's not perfect. And some of the others are in much worse states. So every time we, we bump up in sort of the scale of transaction flow, new, new problems happen. So a, a certain wallet that worked or a certain piece of software that worked when we were doing 500 transactions a day might spit out all sorts of crazy problems when we're doing 2,000 transactions. And then we might fix that. And then again, at 5,000, like a, a whole host of new ones. And then the way that these things interact with each other is problematic. So, you know, like Ripple, for example, has to be entirely on its own server away from every other blockchain because the software is just this resource hog and destroys any other crypto node that's on that same server. So, Noisy neighbor. Yeah, there's, there's like a gazillion edge cases of this stuff, and it's just a constant challenge to figure it out. So to be clear, you have to run full nodes of all these different currencies that you offer exchanging on? Yeah. Now, s- many of these are tokens on one particular blockchain. Like there's a lot of assets that are Ethereum based tokens. So all of them exist on Ethereum. But yeah, we run full nodes to support all the assets in and out. And then at scale, we often have to have multiple nodes because even if we're sending, you know, one Bitcoin transaction every 10 seconds, it might mean that there are 400 requests of the node every 10 seconds, both trying to get the state of the wallet, the addresses that are generated, checking balances, and like all the various things that happen to make one transaction occur. So then we, at some point, we have to have parallelization between different nodes and, and set that up so that you know two wallets aren't sending the same funds to the same person at the same time. Those kind of <laughs> problems can be very dangerous. So that's the, yeah, that's the work. Wow. So maybe this is out of your scope of expertise. I, I don't think you're a software engineer by Correct. trade, Correct. Um, yeah. but I'll ask you anyway. I mean, because most, most of the shows that I do are like, you know, I'm talking to some infrastructure company, like talking to, or t- I'm talking to some company, like traditional infrastructure company, like like Facebook, like has a, you know, okay, it's it, they've got some complex problems, but ultimately, you know, it's like kind of client server model, you've got some databases, and okay, I'm sure they have some complex stuff, but what, what do you think are some unique infrastructure, some other unique infrastructure problems of having to maintain full nodes for all these different blockchains and having to scale them up and down and deal with, I guess you, it, like you said, you've got race conditions between the different nodes. Do you have any other, any stories or other canonical problems that keep coming up? 
Yeah, well, one that a lot of people don't think of is, is simply the balancing of the inventory. So we're holding all these nodes and inventory of each coin so that it's immediately available when a customer wants to do a trade. And we're, we also, so that we can do quick trades elsewhere in the market, we have inventory at many other exchanges. So what that means in real time when you're at scale is that all these inventories of coins are constantly getting out of balance and they have to be moved between each other, right? So Bitcoin might need to move from Kraken, which is an exchange we plug into, back into the hot wallet, or, or then some might need to be sent to Bitfinex. And that multiplied times, you know, 50 different assets 24-7 and, you know, five wallets per asset becomes a really crazy balancing act. And then, of course, you know, the obvious answer is, well, just automate it. But when you automate the movement of crypto, it's really dangerous. So you have to be very careful that things are getting sent to the right places because if you automate a robot and he's spitting out your money into a, you know, an address that doesn't exist, you know, you can burn a million dollars of Ethereum in, in five minutes. So that's been a, a hard challenge as well. So do you have some humans in the loop on bigger transactions? We are pretty close to having no humans in the loop or, or only with a, a little bit of oversight into things. It's it's largely automated at this, at this point. And that was really a necessity. I mean, I, before we had some of these things ready, we had people staying up most of the night just to be balancing things while customers were operating. And the damn crypto markets never close. So there's not like... <laughs> it's not like a Sunday where everyone can go home and ha- and have some beers and watch the football game. It's like the store always has to be open and it's a global business. So it was really, you know, and everything grew so much over the last year and a half that that was really stressful, I think, for our company just on a personal level, trying to deal with those kind of things as the engineering got built out. GoCD is a continuous delivery tool created by ThoughtWorks. It's open source and free to use, and GoCD has all the features you need for continuous delivery. Model your deployment pipelines without installing any plugins. Use the value stream map to visualize your end-to-end workflow. And if you use Kubernetes, GoCD is a natural fit to add continuous delivery to your project. With GoCD running on Kubernetes, you define your build workflow and let GoCD provision and scale your infrastructure on the fly. GoCD agents use Kubernetes to scale as needed. Check out gocd.org slash sedaily and learn about how you can get started. GoCD was built with the learnings of the ThoughtWorks engineering team, who have talked about building the product in previous episodes of Software Engineering Daily, and it's great to see the continued progress on GoCD with the new Kubernetes integrations, you can check it out for yourself at gocd.org slash sedaily. And thank you so much to ThoughtWorks for being a longtime sponsor of Software Engineering Daily. We're proud to have ThoughtWorks and GoCD as sponsors of the show. You talk to any startup and they have some hair on fire moment or uh, epic catastrophe where they think the business is done. It's it's dead. Uh, something has gone wrong and there's no way to recover. And I talked to John, your COO, I think, or he runs operations. And he was telling me about this instance where there was kind of, I guess you had sort of a vulnerability through your support team, like you had a you had a malicious actor in 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 the support team somewhere, and that led to a big catastrophic problem, and then some downtime for the entire system, and there were some doubts as to whether the company would be able to to recover from that. Can you tell me some about that about that moment? If I'm if I'm recounting it correctly, both from the perspective of somebody you know working in cryptocurrency and also just as an as an entrepreneur, because I think there's probably a lot of software entrepreneurs out there that probably are going through something like that. Yeah. So, yeah, this was, we actually publicized this very, very well. It was in April of 2016. We had an employee, he wasn't in the support team. He was actually brought on to do our infrastructure and DevOps work, which is ironic, but he essentially stole a bunch of crypto from us. Again, we don't hold customer money, so there wasn't a risk of customer loss, but it was a pretty significant amount for us. And since he was inside, you know, we had to 
really re-engineer and re-architect a whole bunch of infrastructure after we saw it happen. And so the site was offline, I think, for about three weeks. And that was really stressful. I, you know, I don't think there was a period at which we thought we couldn't come back. But when you're in that moment, you're wondering every day, like how many customers you're losing and and how many more days it's going to be. And, and all the while, you don't know which of your systems are all compromised, right? It might be one thing. It might be all of them. You kind of have to assume it's all of them when someone on the inside was, was in there. And so there, there's just a really like, there's a, a deep vulnerability that you feel as a, as a person when that happens. It's very invasive. And, and you know, it'd be like, it'd be like if, you, if someone had been in your home and you didn't know how they got in or, or what they did, it's a very unsettling feeling. So that, that was rough. We wrote all about it and publicized the whole thing. I wrote like a 15-page blog post about it called uh, The Looting of the Fox. So you can Google that and, and read all about it. It's quite an interesting story and some <laughs> both funny and tragic moments in there. But yeah, that was certainly our hardest period as a company. I will say this does highlight the resilience of the the model that you you know, you've, you've you've talked about already where you just don't hold funds and it lets you sleep at night and then the other side effect of this is you basically just have a business that's like an API and you just make money over time from that API and even if you have some internal employee that steals a bunch of your money and walks away with it and disappears into the night you've still got your software that you built and that's the amazing thing about software is uh, software has this incredible compounding uh, interest effect where if you build software, you know, it's it's very hard to to disable that software as long as you have it backed up. And, you know, even if you, you lose some money that you just, you know, the software still runs, it still keeps making money and compounding interest. I think of software as a very unique asset in that way. Yeah, it's it's a great point. And, uh, you know, we tried to engineer everything such that there's no central point of failure. And I have to say that whole experience, I think, was really a validation of our model, which was that we, you know, reg- regulators always like to, to talk about how well they protect consumers, which is largely, largely bull****, frankly. We actually did protect consumers by building something unique, an entirely new model. And when we got hacked, everyone was protected, not because there was some law about it, but because we, we built it ourselves. And not only that, but we don't take customer information either. So when that hack happened, if we had been taking customer information, all of that would have been stolen as well and leaked out onto the dark web and hundreds of thousands of customers would be dealing with identity theft issues. That was all avoided due to our model as well. And I, th- I think this really demonstrates that crypto and blockchains uh, provide some really unique new business models that can be built that actually improve the safety of people, not through some law that's written down by a politician, but through actual engineering and, and design work. And again, I, I think it is worth emphasizing that this this insight to the business that you built, basically, like not holding funds, I think of it almost as sort of like the insight that Stripe had, where they're just like, oh, if you build a payments API that works really well and has really good documentation, this can be the foundation of a whole suite of products that you could eventually build. And that's similar to what you're doing at Shapeshift. So after you got this currency swapping system working you have expanded into multiple directions you've you've deepened the functionality of that that core competency that currency swapping you've built out an api and you also started spinning up other projects within the company and so since you've got this wealth of opportunity these different directions that you could go in thinking strategically how do you allocate resources between those different projects and particularly between the proven cash cows and the new projects that may or may not work out? Yeah, really good question. So beyond Shapeshift, we we have a few other products. We have coincap.io, which is a market data site for crypto assets. We have Prism, which is a it's a portfolio management system for crypto assets built on Ethereum smart contracts, which is still in closed beta. We acquired KeepKey, which is a hardware wallet company, back in July of this last year. And then we have you know two or three secret projects that we haven't announced yet that are also uh, getting worked on. And so um, all throughout 2017, we ha- we were very much faced with this question of like how do we 
how do we allocate our scarce engineering resources? And we, we started hiring as fast as we could, but you can't just, you know, instantly bring in 100 quality engineers to a company. You know, doing that would be very dangerous, even if you could. So we had to make that decision of how much time and resources do we edic- uh, dedicate to these other projects versus the the core competency shapeshift, which is which is making all the revenue and which is clearly the proven model. So the answer for most of the last year was to put everything we had on on shapeshift to make sure that it it scaled and kept up with the demand that increased by you know 30x over the la- over the year. Now that the current crypto bubble has popped for a little while, at least we are able to catch back up with some of the other projects that we want to work on. And it's been quite a relief. So I don't know that there's a great answer. I mean, we have projects that are awesome that suffered because we just couldn't put people on them last year. But I think ultimately you have to keep the core competence of the, biz- of the business strong and resilient and everything else can come second. And talking about recruiting and compensation in this world, I, I talked to Anthony Diorio from Jax a couple days ago, and he said that he actually does not give out equity in the company. Instead, he has an interesting compensation model where he has kind of like a, it's sort of like a 401k, but not exactly where he just gives people currency and then they can, they have like a currency portfolio over time. Anyway, it's an interesting compensation model, but I also found it striking that he he was just against giving equity in the company. And, but he found that people are inspired nonetheless. So there's, so there's that question about the compensation. I'm also curious, you know, if, if it ties in, how you retain people when you just have, you know, these occasional spikes where a bunch of your employees are probably going to get rich and maybe they'll leave. So, yeah, I don't know. I'm curious about the compensation strategy and the retention strategy. Yeah, well, we definitely have more than a few employees who don't need to be here for their salary. Fortunately, in the crypto world, a lot of the people that work in it have a innate passion for it. So this is both helpful in, in that it's easier for us to recruit than an average company because we're doing something that people are passionate about. It also means that we don't have to pay super elaborate salaries to get people because there's an, an intrinsic motivation there. And then, you know, when, when people do get super rich on crypto, hopefully they don't all, all just leave because they, they still care about the project. We absolutely do give out equity to most of the roles at Shapeshift. Um, you know, there's certain time requirements that you have to be here and certain performance metrics and all that. But I think we take a fairly opposite view of Anthony. Um, we, we generally want people to have a stake in, in the company itself. So I've, I've always felt that that was pretty important. There's been a lot of conversation around stable coins recently. There's many different projects where people are working on stable coins. Uh, and then there's also the whole controversy around Tether, whether or not Tether is an illusion or a religion or what exactly it is. A witch hunt. A witch hunt. Is that what you think it is? Yep. So, so you, have, you have faith in Tether. You have fa- faith that it's backed by dollars? It's not faith. Uh, it's based on seeing zero evidence of malfeasance or wrongdoing and seeing mob mentality gone amok <laughs> at, at Tether. So I think... Tether has a very simple model. They have bank accounts, and when dollars are put into those bank accounts, they create Tether tokens, which are just blockchain assets backed one to one by dollars in the bank account. So the critics all say, you know, they say, well, how do we know that there's dollars? And that has turned into this uh, huge witch hunt where lack of proof in dollars has led to people assuming the opposite, which is that there are no dollars. Largely, this stems from the fact that it's been difficult for them to get audited. And I think anyone that actually runs a crypto company and has tried to work with auditors would have significant sympathy for that situation. Auditors and crypto is an awkward combination. Even finding an auditor to do anything is hard. And then getting unqualified audits, harder still. So it's possible that the, the Tether people are running like the, the biggest scam in crypto that has ever happened. I think that's highly unlikely. And I hope at some point they can get through an audit and actually disprove these rumors because it's been a really obnoxious distraction, I think, for the industry. Yeah, completely agree. It's, it's interesting that your null hypothesis is that they do have those dollars uh, to back the tether itself. I think well, I, for I don't, other people... I don't assume that. I don't, I don't assume either. But lack of evidence showing either shouldn't lead someone to assume a scam, right? Like I haven't seen an audit of Coinbase's reserves. Why don't I assume that they're scamming everyone? It's because the mob hasn't 
gotten in a big tiffy about that one yet. But they have just as few audits as uh, as Bitfinex does. Interesting. So have you talked to anybody on the Tether team? Uh, do you have any? I mean, t- I totally understand. You know, you, the the null hypothesis, you know, thing. But you know, nonetheless, we all have our subjective uh, estimations of people. So maybe you know, if you, if you've talked to them and just you know by talk by virtue of talking to them, maybe you have some subjective opinions that these guys seem legit. Or yeah, I kn- I mean, I think it helps that I know most of the people involved both on the Tether side and on the Bitfinex side, which is a, a partial owner of Tether. I know them, and just on a personal level, I, I trust them to some degree. That's obviously not something that I can just communicate out to everyone because trust is something that is built on a personal level between people. You can't, you can't share the trust, in other words. At the Satoshi Roundtable uh, a few weeks ago, there was a couple guys from Tether and Bitfinex there, and we had a huge discussion with you know 200 people in the room many of the industry leaders about Tether um, to try to clear the air. And hearing them in person and fielding questions directly from people in a room where everyone was there and present, I felt quite confident that they are not running the largest scam in crypto history. But it's really hard to disprove a mob, especially on the internet, especially when it is 100 times easier to create a bunch of angry tweets and Reddit comments than it is to refute them. And when the only when the only refutation that people will accept is a full audit and a full audit, even when you when everything goes well, takes a year. And if things aren't going well, can be much longer than that. It's just a it's a really tricky situation. So, uh, you know, on some level, it's good that the industry is so quick to call things a scam because that self-policing is important. It's sort of like a an autoimmune response. But it often turns into an autoimmune disease where where people just are going on witch hunts perpetually and trying to find all the bad people even when they don't necessarily exist. So it's it's a, a tricky topic. And do you think it could be like a self fulfilling prophecy where I don't know the SEC looks for a reason to to sink tether and and then that ends up destroying what they've built uh, even though they they did actually you know, do their best to, to keep things intact and to keep the one-to-one tether to, to USD? Or, I mean, how do you think this is going to end? Or will it end? <laughs> well, they, they either have the dollars or it's the biggest scam in crypto history. If it's the biggest scam in crypto history, all the people involved in it are known. They're not anonymous. People know where they live. They know who they are. And all those people are are very wealthy early adopters in crypto that run successful businesses. The the notion that they would like perpetuate the scam just to get a little richer in a way that would clearly unravel. If it is a scam, it's, it's essentially like a, a Ponzi scam and those have to fall apart, right? So you, you essentially have a bunch of people that have a bunch of money already and run awesome businesses intentionally starting a Ponzi scheme and then perpetuating it f- like for what? Like it, it doesn't pass the Occam's razor tests in my mind. What does pass the Occam's razor test is that it's really damn hard to get audited and the witch hunts on the internet are really hard to counter. I hear you. Although, you know, one analogy that always comes to mind for me is, I, so I used to play poker and there's this company called Full Tilt Poker that may, you may or may not have heard of where they had all this money and there were very wealthy people who were running it and yet they still they still did these kinds of things where they would just sort of give out customer funds to people that were involved in the company. And, and then also with, with Tether, wasn't there some kind of hacking? Like somebody got, like the Bitfinex got hacked and, you know, you could have had funds got, got stolen there and then they would be in a situation where they don't have enough funds to actually cover the Tether. But I I guess I'm not familiar with that. With that hack specifically, there was some Tether that was stolen and Tether is actually, the company is actually able to handle that really easily because they can essentially blacklist those Tether coins that were stolen and just never redeem those for dollars. So that's actually, I think, a pretty pretty non-issue. But mm. it certainly didn't help their, okay. their PR situation. Okay. All right. Well, I mean, it's really nice to hear the counter-argument because I agree with you that, that there is not much evidence you know, to accuse them. And I think we, you know, we should have, should have some counter arguments. And, and again, I'm not saying that I know that they're legit. I'm just saying I wish more people would take a neutral position of, well, it's not really clear either way. And so I'm just going to reserve judgment. I wish that was a more common instinct, but, but often people just love to like latch on to, to any theory, even if it's supported by little or zero evidence. Absolutely. So I know we're, we're up against time. If you were to take the opposite position on centralized banking, so if you were to if you were to put yourself in the shoes of the smartest 
banking bureaucrat that you know who is in favor of centralized banking, what would be the counter arguments that you would make against the ethos of Eric Voorhees? What are the strongest counter arguments against your ethos? <laughs> I think this, the most compelling argument that bankers do and will continue to make is that, this, is that someone needs to be in control. I think this is the same impetus that leads people to follow religion. It's the same people. It's the same impetus that leads people to follow governments and, and kings. People feel like there has to be a, a leader or someone in control of things. And I don't know what portion of society is is open to the suggestion that certain complicated systems don't need someone in control and actually are better controlled without centralized control. Or in other words, operate better, more efficiently, more safely without uh, centralized control. So I think all that all that the bankers need to do is continue to remind everyone of what they already believe, which is that you know th someone needs to be in charge of of the money so that people are safe. That's really all they need to say, and I'll, I think you know any, any uncritical or unthinking mind will will follow that as the default position. So it's really on Bitcoin and and on the the crypto industry to demonstrate through its existence over time, that there's an alternative there. It's not an argument that could be won in a debate. It's an argument that will be won in time with the evidence of the alternative existing and people seeing what it does. All right, final question. As people start moving to cryptocurrencies and adopting it, what is going to be the response to, to these events from governments? Or are governments going to make their own cryptocurrencies? Or are they just going to crumble? Are they going to merge? What's going to happen with governments? Yeah, th this was our favorite topic to debate on the internet in the early days of Bitcoin. You know, to what extent will the governments just come down and try to destroy this stuff? Fortunately, they have not yet come down and tried to destroy this stuff. And I think it's largely because a mix of economic ignorance and hubris and what I mean when I say that is I don't think most governments actually believe that their fiat currencies are threatened by this. Not yet. I think they don't understand that money is a good that will compete in a marketplace if there are alternatives. And thus, if there's a better alternative, people at the margins will start switching over. I don't think they see it that way. And they've just grown up in a world where governments have been in charge of money. And so they, they just think that like that's how it'll work. So we'll see like how long it takes for them to understand that existential point which is that if crypto really succeeds, it means replacing government currencies, which is really the goal, in my, in my opinion. And along the way, they might try a number of things. You know, I think some governments will try to make their own cryptocurrencies, which will be really silly. I mean, they already have their digital currency. The dollar is already a digital currency. So what point is there for the government to make a crypto dollar? The only point would be that it exists on a blockchain and or can't be inflated and or can't be controlled because that's what those are kind of like important attributes of a, of a cryptocurrency, uh, the government's never going to make a digital form of money that it can't print out of thin air. That will just never happen. And it will never make a form of, of money or payment system that it can't control centrally. So what's the point? I, I think a crypto dollar would look pretty much the same as a current digital US dollar, which exists in a, in a bank. Eric Voorhees, thanks for coming on Software Engineering Daily. It's been really great talking to you. Thanks a lot. Have a great day. Users have come to expect real time. They crave alerts that their payment is received. They crave little cars zooming around on the map. They crave locking their doors at home when they're not at home. There's no need to reinvent the wheel when it comes to making your app real time. PubNub makes it simple, enabling you to build immersive and interactive experiences on the web, on mobile phones, embedded into hardware and any other device connected to the internet. With powerful APIs and a robust global infrastructure, you can stream geolocation data, you can send chat messages, you can turn on sprinklers, or you can rock your baby's crib when they start crying. PubNub literally powers IoT cribs. 70 SDKs for web, mobile, IoT, and more means that you can start streaming data in real time without a ton of compatibility headaches and no need to build your own SDKs from scratch. And lastly, PubNub includes a ton of other real-time features beyond real-time messaging, like presence for online or offline detection, and access manager to thwart trolls and hackers. Go to pubnub.com slash sedaily to get started. 
They offer a generous sandbox tier that's free forever until your app takes off, that is. Pubnub.com slash SE Daily. That's P U B N U B dot com slash S E Daily. Thank you, Pubnub, for being a sponsor of Software Engineering Daily. Wow. 